So I'll be talking about a project that's called Statistical Inference for Fairness Auditing. It's with my advisor, um, who is excellent, Emmanuel Candas. And I guess if I'm going to talk about fairness auditing, I should motivate it with a concrete example. And my concrete example is probably one that any of you who have seen the buzzword fairness in computer science have seen before, which is the Compass data set. So for context, Compass is an algorithm used by the courts in Florida to assign a recidivism prediction score. So what that means is a likelihood of reoffending when they're up for parole. And the idea here is that a high score indicates a higher likelihood for reoffending. Now in 2016, ProPublica launched an investigation of the Compass algorithm and found that the false positive rate of the algorithm for black defendants was much higher than for white defendants. Now, as you can imagine, this caused quite the uproar, right? This meant that among defendants who did not ultimately recidivate, they were much more likely to be inaccurately predicted as high risk. Now, given these false predictions, the last seven years has seen an explosion of research into fairness, building fair models, auditing models for accuracy and fairness. But an important piece of context to have for Compass is that at the same time, the creators of the Compass algorithm argued the false positive rate wasn't quite the right metric to use. And if you used a different metric of model accuracy, which they called positive predictive value, there was no disparity. And I think this example illustrates some of the important problems that we encounter when we talk about algorithmic fairness. That is, what does it mean for a model to be fair? Which metric do you care about? And also, which groups do you care about? These examples deal with two specific racial groups, but there are many groups protected by law. And up till now, existing methods don't really rigorously evaluate a model's fairness or accuracy across a large collection of subgroups, ones that are entirely protected by civil rights legislation in the US, or across a large variety of metrics. So how do we make sense of these competing claims? And I think that's the answer I'm hopefully going to give you, or that's the question I'm hopefully going to answer for you. Okay. So this is the contribution of our work, and I had to put some LaTeX on this slide, that way I looked like I was legit and doing real math. Um, so what we're gonna do is, given any predictive method, pick your favorite black box model and a holdout set that wasn't used for training the model, we'll issue two different kinds of objects. And we'll call the first one a certificate, but for the statisticians out there, which I assume there are really none of, um, these are simultaneous confidence bounds on the disparity that hold over a rich collection of groups. So these groups can be infinitely large, rather than just pairs of racial groups. So in other words, take your favorite problem. It's not even just fairness in terms of racial, racial groups. It could be a person testing self-driving cars and hoping for a guarantee on the quality of the self-driving car's performance over an infinite collection of environments. Okay, the second object that we return is a flag. And this is maybe what people have historically thought of as fairness auditing, which is identifying subgroups for which the model appears to be unfair, for which there appear to be large disparities relative to a target. Now, the crucial contribution of both of these lines of work is that they come with guarantees. So the first one is simultaneously valid with high probability, and that probability is exact. Our 90% intervals will hold 90% of the time. And our flags will also have a false discovery proportion guarantee. So in other words, no more than, let's say, 20% of the issued flags or identified subgroups will be falsely labeled as unfair. Okay, so this is all kind of abstract, um, but maybe we can illustrate this on the Compass data set by validating and studying the two claims made by both North Point, the creators of Compass, and ProPublica. So North Point, if you remember, claimed that the positive predictive value was roughly equal between African American and Caucasian subgroups, meaning that if you made a positive prediction of high risk, both predictions had a roughly equivalent likelihood of being correct. So this is kind of the inversion of the false positive rate. Now, we have access to that same holdout set, and now we're gonna extend this analysis, not just considering African American and white subgroups, but considering every demographic subgroup identifiable in the data set, those formed by the intersections of race, gender, and age. And when we do that, there's actually a whole bunch of different certificates we can provide, but this is just the subgroups for the African American subpopulation. And we can clearly show that North Point was actually correct. There is no significant disparity with high probability, 95%, for the African American subgroup, but when we drill down further, we can see that that guarantee doesn't hold uniformly over all of the various protected subgroups of this subpopulation. So in other words, I can't tell you, for example, that African American women under the age of 25 suffer no PPV disparities. Looking to the flagging problem, remember that ProPublica identified that the false positive rate for African-American offenders was higher than for Caucasian ones. Here, we can again consider 
a more granular description of the problem. That is, localize the fairness disparities to the actual root cause, which in this case would appear to be young African-American defendants that clearly show a higher false positive rate. Okay, so concrete methods aside, why is this important? So I'm, I know I'm out of time, but I'm the last speaker, so I guess that means I get 10 more seconds. Uh, people care a lot about fairness auditing, right? There is legislation this year passed in New York requiring employers to audit their algorithms for resume screening for using an AI audit. Here's an article from a month later from Bloomberg Law claiming that law firms have no idea what to do with this because they don't know what an AI audit means. And that's what we're trying to provide an answer to. A notion of auditing that comes with some formal guarantee that can be applied in a rigorous sense to a rich collection of subgroups that's protected by law. Okay, so there's a paper, there's a package, you can pip install it. Anyways, that's it. Uh, I think if I recall correctly, there was a proof in 2017 that the two definitions you put up are impossible to simultaneously hold. Yep. Um, so I guess my question for you is taking a step back, like how do you reason about these impossibility results or like which fairness metrics someone should actually use, even if they can use your auditing software? Right, so that's actually a great point. In fact, so I'm giving like three versions of this talk. This is the five minute version, there's a 20 minute version next week, and there's an hour long version in August. And there are slides about impossibility results in the other two versions. So I think the real motivation in some ways for this work is that you're right. The two metrics I talked about, PPV and false positive rate, can't be reconciled. You can't achieve equality on both of these metrics simultaneously. But the methods I'm talking about provide simultaneous guarantees, not just over a rich collection of subgroups, but even over multiple metrics. So you can go forward and say, well, I can't guarantee you have the same false positive rate as, let's say, the average person in the population, but I, I can guarantee you you're within 5% of the false positive rate and within 6% on the PPV. And maybe people can be you know, satisfied by this sort of approximation. Uh, just thank you for, for describing. Uh, just to help conceptualize, sort of when we look at the initial data, for example, in these recidivism scores or, or sort of quantitative scores, and then you get to this question of whether or not a positive predictive value was met or not. In your analyses, are you looking at data that is fundamentally quantitative, or do you segregate it then into sort of categorical comparisons of binary outcomes? And, and how does that affect how you interpret what's happening? Right, so in the ProPublica analysis, they binarize the outcomes. I think that's on the first slide. They just take everything over eight and call it one, and they call everything below eight, zero, or not high risk. That being said, there are fairness measures that are amenable to sort of continuous prediction. So I could instead consider a calibration error. That is, if I predict six, is every person who gets a six equally likely to reoffend, right? An African American or Caucasian offender. Um, so there's nothing, you know, everything I've talked about will extend to other notions of, of predictions and covariates that are not just discrete, uh, even though these ones were. <laughs> 